Today we're going to attempt to build the newest Amstrad CPC in the world with all new parts. Will it work? Hello and welcome back to Noel's Retro Lab. This is a modern replica PCB of an Amstrad CPC 464 board made by Rob Taylor. Apart from looking absolutely gorgeous, like something I'd like to hang on my wall and frame it, it's one of the last custom Amstrad CPC 464 parts that were not available to purchase new today. So now that this is available, of course, we need to build our own Amstrad CPC from scratch with all modern parts, or almost. There's still one part that is not quite ready, but we'll come back to that one in a bit. Today's video is part of Janstrad, sorry about the horrible hashtag, which are videos about Amstrad computers coming out this month from different content creators. Check out the link to the playlist in the description for other similar videos. Okay, let's have a look at this gorgeous board again. The board is an early revision of the 464 boards. I don't know them all by heart, but I can tell it's early because it uses the 40007 gate array. In later ones, we'd use the 40010 or even have room for both in a transition period. And also the keyboard connector in this version uses cables instead of ribbons from the membrane directly. The board goes beyond just being an exact replica though. It enhances the original board by not just labeling each component, but also explaining what they are and what values they have. We see the Z80 CPU, AY audio, and even the exact values for capacitors and resistors. And the board is roomy enough that it can all fit comfortably there. So that's a really nice touch when it comes time to build it. Since this is just the board and not a full kit, we need to assemble the components ourselves. And the first thing we need to do is generate a list of components, what in most projects is called a bill of materials or BOM. Since the values are written on the board, we could just scan those values and write down a list with the components. And actually that might be the safest possible way of doing it. I did it in a slightly different way. In the system manual for the Amstrad CPC 464, it includes a full list of components. So I thought it would be easier to start from there. When I do this, I usually create a spreadsheet and I start writing down all the components and the amounts I need. Then I mark them as something I already have or something I need to order. And then by color coding them, I can keep track of their status, already owned, ordered, or not done anything about it yet. It turns out that basing the list from the system menu might not have been such a great idea. Partway through when I was writing down what I needed, I noticed some really specific and unusual values of capacitors, which wouldn't make much sense in the main board. Then I realized that this list also included the components for the tape deck PCB, which is not something that we're going to be building today. So I removed those from the list. Later, I found out that Rob had already created a very nice bill of materials list for this PCB. So that's definitely the way to go if you end up doing your own build. Afterwards, I also realized that it could be some very slight component differences between the list in the service manual and what this very specific version of the PCB needs. Hopefully not, but we're about to find out. And after placing the orders and waiting for a few weeks, here's the result. I've added just the right amount of each component that we're going to need. So in a way, I've built my own Amstrad CPC kit right here. And now we're finally ready to start. When you have a big soldering project like this one, it's ideal to be able to build it in stages and check that everything works correctly up to that point. Since I'm pretty familiar with the Amstrad CPC architecture, I spent a little while pouring over the schematics and trying to come up with a few stages that would make sense. But in the end, I just gave up. Not only would it require some extra time to come up with those stages, but if I made a small mistake, it could lead to a false positive, meaning that I might think that it's not working even though it is correctly assembled, or even worse, it could cause some parts to be damaged. So in the end, I'm just going to solder it all at once. If it doesn't work, then we'll have to apply the normal repair procedure to diagnose it and fix it as usual. Although to make things more challenging, this board is untested. So it's possible that some trays might not be connected correctly somewhere and we'll have to take that into account. Or maybe everything will just work the first time. Yeah, not happening. I'm gonna follow the usual order of shallower components to bulkier ones. So I'll start out with the resistors. Fortunately, the value of the resistor is also listed on the board. So now it's when it really pays off. To speed things up, I'm gonna try to do multiple resistors at once. I put them in place, hold them with tape or something similar, and then I solder them and cut their legs all at once. And yes, I'm still cutting the legs after soldering because it's so much more convenient. After all the resistors, it's time for the sockets. And since I'm socketing everything, that is a lot of sockets. Again, I tried to do several at once. I first soldered the corners and checked that everything is level. 
and then I solder the rest of the pins. And to be honest, this is by far the most boring part of the project. Row after row after row of pins. Maybe I'll enlist some help with this. Hi. Hey, um, got a job for you. If you help me do some solder in here, we can play some Minecraft afterwards. Okay. And just like that, the board continues assembling itself without my help. She's actually been doing this for a few years already, so she's a pro. And she has better eyesight than me. Okay, now it's time for Minecraft. Okay, quick break for some Minecraft, and I'll be right back. With all the ICs in place, the next step are the decoupling capacitors. These are mostly 0.1 microfarads, and they go along with every chip, so that's pretty straightforward. And it was all going great when suddenly I encountered the first big, big problem. I was doing a couple of measurements on the board to figure out the transistors when I ran across the nightmare situation when you're building a board from scratch. And that is a total short between VCC and ground. And tracking that down can be really difficult. The problem is that it can happen anywhere. So Sure, this is VCC and ground is shorted there, but it's also shorted there, and it's shorted really everywhere by because they're all connected. So it's really difficult to narrow it down to which one it is. If there was a chip on and it was a minor short, meaning there was a short, but it wasn't complete short, then we could measure the resistance between two points, and we would get lower and lower values as we get there. But here, we always get the same value all over the board because it's so little. We have like pretty much one ohm of resistance. So trying to reason this out, we can look at things that are connecting VCC to ground and that could have failed. So obviously one of the horrible situations would be if it's a short that happens under a socket. And I've had those happen before, but I don't think it's possible on this board. And that's because the VCC line and the ground lines on sockets are usually not, not next to each other. Well, in this case, they're never next to each other. They're usually on opposite ends of the chip. So that couldn't have been a somehow extra solder that connected the two on the board. Besides, the mask on the board looks good. So it's not like there's a connection, um, an, an open connection between two, um, between VCC and ground. So I'm going to rule sockets out. I don't have to take them all out. Resistors are, as far as I know, there are no resistors connecting VCC to ground. So that's not likely to be a faulty one. And besides, when resistors are faulty, they usually mostly they just break. So it's an open. So that leaves the capacitors that I put in here. It could be that one of those ceramic capacitors is shorted. And obviously, I can't just measure it because they're all going to register as short. So I could remove them all, but it's a lot of them. So I'm not happy to do that either. And the other possibility is that it could be something wrong with the board itself, the way it was designed. And I'm kicking myself for not measuring VCC and ground before I started soldering on the board. Um, I didn't think about it. I, I should have done it, but I didn't. So I don't know, did that happen when I put the capacitors or was that there before? At this point, I decided to reach out to Rob Taylor, who designed this board. I figured that he would at least have another one of these boards without the components, and he'd be able to do a sanity check for me. So he did that and VCC and ground were shorted there as well. And not only that, but after a couple of hours, he identified not just one, but two mistakes that were causing that short. The first one was on the taped deck connector. The first pin is VCC, the second pin is ground, and the third pin is the input voltage for the power supply. The reason it's set up that way is because this goes to the switch next to the tape deck that turns the computer on. So when the switch is on, it connects pins one and three to give power to the whole computer. But if you look closely in the underside of the connector, you see a sneaky little track connecting pins one and two. Wow. The second short was much more subtle. Overall, this is a really roomy board, but in a few places, tracks are a bit crammed against each other. One of those decoupling capacitors has a ground line running right next to it. So much right next to it, in fact, that it overlaps with the eyelet of the capacitor itself. Clearly, that's not right either. So how could this happen? It doesn't make any sense to short VCC and ground like that, right? If you were designing a circuit from scratch, you're totally right. But these boards were not created that way. From what Rob told me, he doesn't try to recreate the circuit and then come up with a similar layout, which is how you would do it if you use something like KiCad for some design that you've made. 
Instead, he actually traces the board and makes a new one like that. To do this, he uses the original board that was stripped down, usually one that's not good anymore, maybe it was rusted or broken in different ways, and he literally traces it from that. He traces every track, every via, every silk screen line. It sounds like an amazing time-consuming job, and that's because it is. You can think of the difference between these two approaches as if you were going to make a copy of a page in a book. With one approach, you would read the letters, type them out on a word processor, and then change the font and the layout to match it approximately to the original page. In the other approach, which is the one that Rob uses, you would simply trace every line on the page whether it was, it was a letter or not. You would just do it with everything. The advantage of Rob's approach is that he can really make the new board look very, very close to the authentic one. Since he's going for the feel of a replica, that seems like a really good approach. There are two downsides, though. The first one, as we just saw, is that since this is just copying the pattern without trying to make sense of the underlying connection, it's possible to have some silly layout mistakes that throw everything off. The other one is that this is kind of a dead end as far as the evolution of this board. Once you have this perfect copy, it's extremely hard to modify it. And why would you want to do that? Well, it could be really fun to expand on the original board to include some modern accessories built in, maybe a RAM expansion or a disk controller, or even some kind of TZX Duino. That's clearly not his plan, but that's a door that is closed permanently by doing the boards this way. And so to circle back to the mistakes in this board, the first one was caused because the original board had a small mark between the VCC and ground pins, and he thought that was an actual track, so he added it to his own board. For the capacitor short, that was just a slight mistake, making the ring around the capacitor a bit too large and overlapping the neighboring track. So now we need to fix these shorts without waiting for another iteration of the board. If this was just a missing connection instead, it would have been really easy because we can just solder a wire. Here we have a couple of connections we want to remove, so we need to physically break those connections by scraping the tracks until they're gone. I normally use a small screwdriver for this, and I'll try to scrape pushing hard and trying to be controlled to prevent the screwdriver from breaking other tracks. I'm not going to show it in the microscope because I can't do that without shaking everything, but after a few minutes, this is the final result. It's not pretty, but you can see how the metal track is gone completely and it shows the non-conductive substrate. Breaking the capacitor connection was a little harder since that wasn't just an extra track, but an overlap of the tracks. But after enough scraping, I managed to separate the two tracks correctly. You can also now check the continuity with the multimeter and verify that the connection is broken, so we're all good to go. And with that out of the way, it's time to finish populating the board. Next up are the transistors. This is not as straightforward as it may seem because there are a lot of different transistor models, and oftentimes the ones originally used aren't manufactured anymore. And since the whole point is to build a new computer from scratch with modern parts, I looked at modern equivalent transistors for each of the ones on the Amstrad. Another thing to watch out for is the transistor layout itself. Sometimes you'll find an equivalent transistor, but it'll have the collector base and emitter in different places from the original transistor. For example, here I'm substituting a KTC 2021Y NPN transistor with a common BC547. The data sheet lists the collector base and emitter in this order, but looking at the circuit schematics, I see that they need to be fitted in this order on the PCB. So I need to bend the lights a little bit and twist it to get it to fit just right. It doesn't look perfect, but it's a small price to pay to be able to use all modern parts. I needed to repeat the process with the two other transistors, which unfortunately are all different models and configurations, so they all need to be soldered in different ways. And now we just have the rest of the connectors. and two electrolytic capacitors too. And before we do anything else, we need to clean the flux residue on the underside. There's a lot accumulated since I wasn't cleaning it as I was going, so I had to be very generous with the amount of alcohol and do it in multiple passes, but it eventually managed to clean it up pretty well. As a really rough initial test, I'm going to power on the board with really with nothing connected. So I just want to make sure that we don't have another kind of weird short. So we really should see pretty much no current draw at all. So I'm going to connect the power supply right there. And I'm also going to connect this connector, which is something that I have in my toolbox. It just simulates the on switch on the CPC board. I'm going to use the bench power supply set to 5 volts, center positive, And it, I'm only going to do a maximum of half an amp, just in case something goes really wrong. And really, we should see 
no current coming through. And perfect. Uh, that's tiny little amount. I don't know if some leftover resistance or whatever, but that's that's what I wanted to see. So, so far, so good. Okay, last part is to put the ICs themselves. I'm going to go ahead and put all of them except the RAM and the ROM, since those are not needed for the diagnostics programs that we're going to be using. There's something I didn't mention earlier, but now it's finally time to talk about that. One of these chips isn't manufactured today, so it had to be a scavenge from an original Amstrad CPC, the Gate Array. That was the custom chip that Amstrad designed for the CPC range. Pretty much every computer of the time has a custom chip with a logic that glues the whole computer together. The Commodore 64 had the PLA, the ZX Spectrum, the ULA, etc. And right now, the number of Amstrad Gate Arrays in the world is limited. And as they continue to fail and disappear, the number of Amstrad CPCs out there continues getting smaller and smaller. The good news is that that is the last part we need to create brand new Amstrad CPCs. And even better, I'm in touch with a couple of people who are working on a replacement Gate Array project. The chip itself has been decapped quite a while ago, and the internal logic seems to be pretty well understood, and there are even FPGA implementations of full CPC systems, so a reasonable implementation with a CPLD or an FPGA really can't take too long to be a reality. I'm really hoping to be able to make a video soon demoing a full replacement for an Amstrad CPC Gate Array. That's kind of one of my dreams. Okay, let's power it on. And again, just make sure we don't have any horrible shorts anywhere. And that looks about right. Okay, good. Next step. Now it's finally time to run the diagnostics run. Will it work? And we get nothing. Not even a blank video signal from the look of it. That usually means no activity of any kind, which is usually because there's no clock signal. This is what the clock circuit looks like in this version of the Amstrad CPC. It actually changed a little bit just in the very next revision of the board. This is a 16 MHz crystal oscillator sent a few times through a NAND gate to turn the signal into more of a square wave that then is fed to the gate array. And as soon as I started looking into the clock signal circuit, I saw that there was nothing whatsoever. <laughs> so I started tracing it and look at this. There's a place in the clock circuit that needs a capacitor, but our board has nothing. Absolutely nothing, no label, and it doesn't even have plated VS to solder it there. The clock circuit wasn't closed correctly, so it's not surprised that there was no clock signal at all. I mentioned this to Rob, and it turns out the original PCB had the correct VS in there, but it didn't have any silk screen markings. And since he started tracing it with a board without any components, he never realized that the capacitor was supposed to be there in the first place. He immediately fixed it for the next revision, so now it's very clearly marked in the revised version of the board. The easiest way to fix this was to solder the capacitor directly from the trace to the resistor next to it. Unlike last time, now we just want to scrape the solder mask, not the metal track underneath. So this has to be done very lightly. And once I did that, I added some flux and I was able to solder the capacitor in place. Definitely not the prettiest job ever, but it works. And with that fixed, when I ran the diagnostics test again, we finally got an image. I know it doesn't look like much, but I was super excited to finally see some signs of life from this board. Since we're gonna be testing this for a while, I'm actually going to put the diagnostics ROM in place of the system ROM to avoid having to press the button on the external cartridge every time I turn the computer on. I also went ahead and filled the RAM since it might give us some help with the diagnostics. Okay, let's give it another try. Oh. That. Oh, and even the sound. So this is exactly the beginning of the diagnostics test. And then it just locked up or not. <laughs> and I definitely heard the sounds as well. So this is doing a lot right. And then something is going wrong. So the good news is there's a lot that is working correctly. The bad news is that it may be a pretty subtle problem that we have here. So given what we've seen, I'm kind of suspicious of the clock signal. And that's the first thing to check anyway. So let's start there. I want to look at the clock signal going into the gate array, just the easiest way is to get it right here after all the AND gates. And that looks okay. So it's 16 megahertz. So that's great. The shape is a little not great, but maybe that's normal given the, um, given the circuit. So that looks reasonable. 
Then there is a clock signal generated by the gate array that goes to the Z80. Oh, I don't like the shape of that at all. So this is four megahertz, so that's perfect. But that is not a good square wave at all. It barely reaches zero, has no time there. I wonder if that's causing that. So this signal is generated by the get array and it comes out of pin 39 and on this particular version on the 40,010 is a little different. So it comes out of here and then it's amplified. So that's what comes out. And again, that is not square at all. And then of course, when this is amplified, I think it's right there then it's just yeah what we saw earlier i i don't like the way it comes out at all now it could be because the transistor we put in here maybe is not an equivalent to what su was supposed to be there and so it's messing that up somehow but you know it's, the base of the transistor is connected to this and i doubt i mean unless this is somehow i got completely the wrong configuration and it's not really the base and I'm affecting that signal. Um, I know this get array is fine. I've tested it in another board. Um, so normally there is a perfectly fine square wave coming out of there. So that's not it. One quick way to check if the transistor is affecting the signal or if there's something wrong with the way the get array is set up is to carefully lift pin 39. That way it won't be affected by a transistor and we can measure it what the get array is really generating. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. So this is the signal that not only was it very rounded, but it was the, the amplitude was much, much, much smaller. I mean, this it feels like we could almost feed this directly into the Z80. Uh, maybe they have the buffering thing because then this would draw too much current and it could damage the gate array. So I'm not going to do that. But this tells me that definitely however we set up here this transistor there's something wrong either I chose the wrong one or there's something not laid out quite properly on the board itself I really wanted to avoid using components that aren't manufactured today but for now I'm going to use an original transistor from a donor board to eliminate any potential problems and now with the original transistor let's see what kind of clock signal we get on this Z80 oh wow look at that perfect clock signal into the Z80, not that horrible mess that we saw earlier. So that was definitely it. The transistor that I thought was equivalent definitely wasn't equivalent. And now let's test it again with the diagnostics ROM. Oh, oh, perfect. Perfect. So that was it, that transistor all along. Next, I want to check that the keyboard and joystick are working correctly. So I need to connect a keyboard. It would be fantastic if we had a modern keyboard that we could just hook it up and then also have a modern case. But for now, we'll have to use an original case and keyboard. It would be great if eventually we can also make a reasonable replica of those and make a completely modern version of the Amstrad CPC. But we're going to have to wait a little while for that. Fortunately, I have this somewhat beat up case that I can use, although unfortunately it's missing a space bar. So if someone has a spare one of this type, please let me know. I'd love to have that. It's exactly the kind of case that would come with this revision of the board too from the keyboard connector. And back in the diagnostics ROM, we can test the keyboard, which seems to be working fine, except for the nine on the numeric keypad. Oh, weird. Maybe the keyboard is dirty or something. I mean, everything else is working. Even the joystick works correctly, so that's great. Now let's put an EEPROM with the correct system ROM in place. And there you go. The basic screen starts up right away. Excellent. And yes, this seems to be working totally fine. And as a final test, let's go ahead and run some games. I know Gunfright isn't everybody's favorite game, but I have really fun memories of that one. And yes, it works great, other than not being able to shoot very well because of the missing space key. Arkanoid it also works great, and it also shows that the sound is working correctly. So I'm going to call this build a success. 
So here we have finally a brand new Amstrad CPC 464 board. And this is a great step because now the only part left that we need to replace is the gate array. I feel that these kind of replica projects are great because they allow us not just to better understand and preserve all systems like these, but to give them a new life and continue making them. For some people, an FPGA implementation of an old computer is enough, and that's great. But for those of us who really enjoy handling and examining and repairing the actual hardware, having these modern replicas is a great way to go. Maybe today it's not a big deal since Amstrad boards are plentiful, but what about in 10 years or 50 years from now? Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. I know Rob has been working on an Amstrad CPC 61281, so maybe at some point I'll get to make a similar video building a CPC 6128, which should be really fun, even though that board is much, much more cramped than this one. So let me know if you have any comments below, and I'll see you next time. If you enjoyed this video, please consider supporting Noel's Retro Lab on Patreon or joining the membership on YouTube. Not only is that the best way to support this channel and allow me to continue making more videos, but you also get some extra perks like early access, ad-free videos, and more. Thank you again to all the supporters. See you next time.